The redesignation uh, of my portfolio into focusing on energy, science and technology actually um, provides um, a very targeted, a very focused approach in terms of how we see the need for long-term planning uh, for our energy needs that has to be sustainable, um, that has to be resilient, and at the same time, it has to be affordable as well. It allows a more seamless coordination across the different government agencies within Singapore itself. And also at the same time, when we negotiate internationally, all of these ministries actually have dedicated energy ministers. So it allows us to therefore engage on a, on a, not just a deeper level, but on a more targeted level. Whether it is dealing with uh, uh, the OECD, whether it's de dealing with the International Energy Agency, the International Renewable Energy Agency, to even the IAEA, the International Atomic uh, uh, Energy Agency, they actually now have someone within NTI to deal with almost on a day-to-day -day basis if necessary, and an entire team within the MTI, MTI division supporting you know, our future ambitions. I think that's the, the overarching uh, ambition, and that is how do we, while, address, while we address the, the, the climate change demands, also continue to uplift our households continue to support our domestic uh, uh, needs, uh, at the same time continue to keep the economy growing. I acknowledge that our initiatives will result in increased costs, particularly in the form of electricity tariffs. But I think what is just as important is to understand that the government will continue to roll out measures to support both our businesses and our households. More so our households to make sure that whether it's in the form of uh, utility rebates like USAFE rebates and so on, it will be targeted at uplifting the lower income households. There will be climate vouchers to encourage them to switch to more energy saving appliances, green appliances. At the businesses level, we will work with them through energy efficiency grants to see, to help them to, to, to manage this impact and, and this cost. I think collectively, we are doing our level best. We are exploring every different pathway, all the possibilities, and hopefully our partnerships also will pay off and enable us to achieve that purpose of sustainability, affordability, and at the same time, resilience. I think then we would have arrived. So, it is not going to be possible for the cost to not go up. But what we will endeavour to do is to manage that gradient of cost increases in the most judicious, in the most disciplined manner, and supplementing it with rebates, supplementing it with grants to help our local population, our domestic households and businesses. We hold a lot of promise for renewable energy imports. It is not a new source of uh, energy, but uh, I think certainly um, it is what we're thinking of in terms of, of one of the, uh, the potential sort of uh, pathway for us to decarbonize. The other uh, three other pathways that I talked about, whether it's carbon capture, hydrogen, or even for that matter, advanced uh, nuclear energy technologies, I think it's still some distance away. Geothermal, I think uh, we're at a very nascent state. So I think in the foreseeable uh, next five years, you will see a lot of work on renewable energy imports and at the same time still natural gas and how to decarbonize natural gas.
we have a lot of natural resources within ASEAN for renewable energy generation. Singapore doesn't have, because of the limited land space we have, geographically we are disadvantaged. But in Vietnam, you know, with a long coastline facing the South China Sea, the significant wind potential on top of solar and tidal uh, energy. Within Indochina itself, within Borneo, Sarawak for instance, there's significant hydroelectric power. In Indochina, so Laos PDR, on top of hydroelectric power, they have got solar power, likewise with uh, Cambodia. And in Borneo, significant hydroelectric power. Now the key thing is, how do we therefore by connect sources of natural resource, renewable energy to areas of high economic development where this renewable energy is significantly needed. And this power grid would be one of the key solutions in allowing that to happen. So by opening up the channels, by improving the connectivity and the access itself, you could unlock the entire region's decarbonization potential. So it would help ASEAN collectively as a bloc to achieve its net zero ambitions earlier. At the same time, it can bring economic development to many of these far outlying areas with significant renewable energy generation potential, but they may not necessarily have that same financial resources to unlock this type of potential. In fact, a well-connected ASEAN power grid can reduce broadly electricity costs by a couple of percent. I think it's, it's, it's three to four percent. And it can actually stimulate the GDP growth by about 0.8 to about one, one over percent, depending on, 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 on which place you're talking about. In some of the countries, it can even go up to about 3-4% in terms of GDP growth. So it is a win-win-win partnership, win-win-win potential for everyone within the region itself.